Coming up on this edition of Arirang News, South Korea bows out of the 2014 World Cup in Brazil Thursday following a 1-0 loss to Belgium. Mixed signals on Korea's economic recovery. Industrial output for the month of May shrinks for the second straight month. And a look at fresh dynamics in Northeast Asia. Is North Korea cozying up with Japan now rather than its traditional ally, China? Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Kang Tae in Seoul. We now have the names of all 16 teams that are staying behind in Brazil for the remainder of the World Cup 2014. And Korea is not on the list. Team Korea lost its uh, final group match against Belgium 1-0, packing up with a draw and two losses and not a single win. And for more, uh, Song ji Sun uh, is joining us in the studio. Pretty disappointing for Team Korea this time around. Right. I've been telling you that we need to have a lot of conditions met to Korea to advance next round. Korea had to win Belgium by a massive victory and Russia had to draw or beat Algeria. But all those failed because Korea lost 1-0 and Russia drew 1-1 with Algeria. Now, Coach Hong Myung will finally change his mind to put Kim shin as the lone striker in his lineup and even replaced goalkeeper Chong song nyung with Kim sun gyu Now, Kim actually fared pretty well in his first World Cup, but lost a goal as Belgium's Jan Vertonghen lets after Kim failed to hang on to a shot. Now, just before the end of the first half, Belgium's Steven Defoe was sent off for stepping on Kim sun ankle by intention. But the Korean footballers could not take advantage over the 10-man squad of Belgium. I know. Now, Korea's head coach, Hong myung bo has a lot of questions to answer when he comes back. Uh, is it Monday, I believe? Now, I guess one of them is, was the best 11 the best for the Korean squad? We have to start with the one-top Park Jung, who started the first two matches as a starting member. Now, of course, Coach Hong expected Park Jung to have that one magical one shot. But Park, who's been sitting on the bench for most of the time in his own club, started Korea's two first two critical matches, only to go very unnoticed the whole while. In the meantime, Park leaves Brazil without a single goal or run for the goal, while the two other forwards, domestic players, replaced Park in the second half in the first two matches. Now, those are Lee Gun Ho serving in the military plane for the Army team's Hang Mu, who scored while playing less than a half, and tall Kim shin who did well fighting off the Algerian and the Belgian players for the ball. And Korea's young midfielders who play in the European leagues all the shows greater potential. Son Heung-min scored his first ever World Cup as the youngest player on the squad, and Captain Kuteter Ter also played his part as Ki Sang Yong backed up these strikers. Now, Korea's elimination this time around means all four Asian squads are dropped. They, none of them made it to the next round. What went wrong with the Team Korea as well as the other Asian squads? Well, those are Iran, Japan, Korea, and Australia. And for Korean mm. squad, they made it easy for their opponents because their lineup was pretty much the same from the friendlies and their previous international matches. But for Belgium, they changed seven starting members for the Korean match making it harder for the Korean squad. Now, Korea's performance in Brazil 2014 is the worst since the 1990 France World Cup. But as you say, we're not the only Asian team leading Brazil with our heads down. Now, Asia will not be representing the round of 16 and without a single victory in 24 years, the region's Kuda quota could be at a risk. Now, there are quite a few analysis why the Asian squads fared this bad and showed poor performance in mm -hmm. the World Cup. And people are saying that the Asian squads were not prepared well or offered the standards of the advanced football strongholds like Europe and South Africa. I also noticed that in their physicals as well, fighting for the ball in the matches. And of course, there are very few players who are playing in those advanced football fields like in the European leagues as well as the South American fields. And there's also another factor that uh, the Asian players were playing in the farthest continent from their region. As we could saw, the South American con uh, players were excelling in this round of the group matches. So looking forward, we have the, the top 16 left, the round of 16. So how do the games roll from here on? Well, we have no match for this Friday as the top 16 get a day off to prep for the next match and to get a rest. But for starting with the uh, weekend matches, actually there are 14 from the host continent who are giving it uh, actually starting with Brazil and Chile who are going to start their match at 1 p.m. on Saturday local time. But in the meantime, Luis Suarez, who will not be able to play for his national <laughs> team because this Euro Four was banned from nine international matches, as well as four months of not participating in football-related activities for biting an Italian opponent 
in the last match. And on Sunday, the top scoring squad of the Netherlands at 10 goals right now will go against Mexico. Now check out if Mexico's goalie Guillermo Ochoa can keep the free scoring Dutch squad at bay. All right, so uh, disappointing for Team Korea and Korean supporters out there, but the show must go on and um, it gets exciting, I guess, in the round of right. 16. All right, thank you very much, uh, Chizan, for that report. Thank you. And Team Korea's early exit from the World Cup is a bitter pill to swallow for a lot of supporters here. But uh, although many knew in the back of their minds that making it to the next round would be a long shot here, the Red Devils still turned out in force today for a watch parties nationwide in hopes of a miracle. Our Shin Semin has the scenes. Upset about losing the match against Belgium, Korean fans left the last cheering venue for the Brazil World Cup with their heads held low. Korea's elimination also spells the end to all Asian hopes in the tournament. Thousands of fans had been cheering on the streets in front of COEX in southern Seoul since early Thursday evening, some 10 hours before the kickoff. The fans hoping a red card for Belgium in the first half would make it easier to win couldn't hide their disappointment after the game. I thought we had the advantage when I saw the Belgian player get a red card. I really think we could have done a better job. Even against a Belgium team down to 10 men, the game didn't go well. The result is very regrettable. I wish there was another chance. The fans spent all night waiting, and pre-game K-pop performances were held at the venue to keep the early birds motivated and entertained. With the fall of the national team in Brazil, some supporters are already looking ahead to the 2018 World Cup. It's a great shame we didn't make it to the last 16. Now we'll just wait for the next World Cup in four years' time. Failing to advance to the final 16, Korea will have to go again in 2018 World Cup in Russia. The fans had fun, and everyone thanks the squad for trying their best in Brazil. Shin Semin, Arirang News. For the latest in news that impacts Korea and the world, join Kang Chedi for a lively half hour that covers politics, business, international news, and much more. Live at 8, every weeknight on Arirang TV. Human Rights Council headquarters in Geneva on Thursday, finding ways to... Korea's production in the mining and manufacturing sectors dropped last month by the biggest margin in more than five years, raising concerns of a slowdown in economic recovery. But analysts say it's still a bit too early to call this a drop a trend. Hwang Jie tells us why. Korea's pace of economic recovery is in question once again with the nation's output in the manufacturing and mining sector falling 2.7 percent in May from a month earlier. That marks the biggest drop since December 2008 when the global financial crisis broke. Statistics Korea says that the dip came largely from the automobile and semiconductor industry, which saw sluggish exports last month, but added that the weak data does not necessarily mean the Korean economy is losing momentum. The dip in exports are mainly due to fewer working days in May, prompted by long holiday weekends, while exports to Southeast Asian nations also remained poor. In fact, while Korea's overall exports dropped 1 percent last month from a year earlier, the average daily export volume rose 6 percent to around 2.2 billion U.S. dollars, the second highest level in history. Looking forward, experts also say it's likely that the Korean economy will remain on the track to recovery thanks to the U.S. economy, which has a huge effect on the nation's exports. Although the first quarter growth in the United States was held back by an unusually cold winter, recent employment and consumption data are showing a firm upward trend. And the nation's output data was not all negative. Service sector production rose 0.6 percent in May from a month ago after declining more than 1 percent in April. Retail sales also rose 1.5 percent, a sign that the economy might be out of the sluggish private spending trap brought on by the deadly ferry disaster.
Although it added that more research is needed, the statistics agency said the Korean economy hit a low point sometime in late 2012 or early 2013. And based on that analysis, the economy should now be on a rebound trend. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. In the meantime, Korea posted a current account to surplus for the 27th straight month in May, the second longest streak on record. The Bank of Korea says the preliminary data suggests the surplus reached 9.3 billion U.S. dollars last month, down 4.6 percent on year, but up more than 30 percent on month. The central bank attributes this bump to improved conditions for exports of shipping and petrochemical products and the economic recovery in developed economies. The diplomatic dynamics in Northeast Asia are complex, to say the least, with historical and territorial differences meeting head-on with security concerns. But recently, North Korea and Japan have been cozying up, and our Connie Kim reports on the latest developments. Nine Japanese nationals are in Pyongyang through next Thursday to pay their respects to relatives who died in North Korea after the Second World War. After a lot of efforts between the Japanese and North Korean government, our hope has finally come true. There have been eight visits like this one since 2012, but yesterday's comes against the backdrop of a new dynamic in Sino-Japanese relations. That is, since North Korea and Japan agreed last month to reopen an investigation into the whereabouts of Japanese abductees kidnapped by the North decades ago. Diplomats from Tokyo and Pyongyang will meet in China next week to discuss the details of a probe into the abduction of Japanese citizens in the 1970s and 80s. North Korean officials are set to explain how a special committee plans to carry out its investigation. Now, if Japan feels the North is doing enough to reopen the probe, unilateral sanctions imposed by Tokyo on the North Korean regime could be eased, including the lifting of a ban on North Korean vessels into Japanese ports. Interesting timing, given that Chinese President Xi Jinping is set to visit Seoul next Thursday for a two-day state visit. And he is not expected to stop by Pyongyang, going against the tradition that Chinese leaders have made it a point to visit the North before coming to Seoul. Connie Kim, Arirang News. In what's become a regular occurrence, North Korea launched three short-range projectiles into the East Sea Thursday afternoon. However, unlike other recent tests, this one centered on a new type of missile that South Korean authorities say had never been fired before. Kim Hyun-bin reports. North Korea claimed Friday that the three projectiles it fired into the East Sea on Thursday were newly developed state-of-the-art precision-guided missiles. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un was at the scene on Thursday and watched over the launch process. The missiles were airborne for around 190 kilometers before landing in waters between North Korea and Japan. The projectiles bear a similarity to North Korea's KN-09 missiles, but the maximum range was 40 kilometers further than a KN-09. The primary goal of North Korea's every activity is regarding the threatening uh, other neighboring countries, particularly towards Seoul and Washington, is to stabilize or solidify the Kim Jong-un regime's survival. They want to make a new pressure uh, toward uh, getting back to the six-party talks, the so-called uh, denuclearization process. In February and March, Pyongyang fired off ballistic missiles and short-range projectiles on eight separate occasions. In March and April, the regime conducted numerous naval exercises near the northern limit line, increasing inter-Korean tensions along the border. Some experts say the most recent firing was initiated to unite North Korean troops behind Hyun yong Chur, who is the new minister of the People's Armed Forces, after Chang jong nam was relieved of this post. In one way, it could be seen as a test of the military's missile capabilities. It could also be a way to check the response times of the U.S., South Korea and Japan. Following this latest test firing, the South's Defense Ministry says it's on alert for additional provocations from the North. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. A new Hollywood comedy dealing with an assassination plot against North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has caught the attention of Pyongyang now. It warned that the release of this film, which is due out in this fall, would be, quote-unquote, an act of war. The co-director of this movie says Pyongyang is overreacting. Will this film hit the theaters? Our Kwon has more. 
could a comedy movie trigger a war? According to a North Korean foreign ministry spokesperson, yes. North Korea has come out all guns blazing against the first ever American movie dealing with its leader Kim Jong-un. The interview is an action comedy that centers on how a talk show host and his producer, played by James Franco and Seth Rogen, embark on a CIA mission to assassinate Kim. Rogan, who also co-directed the movie, says he was inspired by journalists making trips to the communist country and hypothetical discussions on how they would be in the ideal position to assassinate the world's most dangerous people. But as can be seen in the trailer, the movie is hardly sinister in nature. However, it was enough for North Korea to call the movie an act of terrorism and an act of war. Pyongyang's foreign ministry spokesperson threatened merciless retaliation if the film is released. Seth Rogen is not taking the threat too seriously. Upon hearing of the North's reaction to the teaser, Rogen tweeted, People don't usually want to kill me for one of my movies until after they've paid 12 bucks for it. Days before the North's threat, Rogan had tweeted, apparently Kim Jong-un plans on watching the interview. I hope he likes it. The interview is expected to hit big screens in the U.S. in October. No word yet on whether it will be released in South Korea. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And it's uh, time now to get a recap on this week's domestic headlines. Our Yudian is here with us. Good evening now. President Park Geun-hye's decision to turn down Prime Minister Jung Hong-won's offer to resign after two failed attempts to appoint a new Prime Minister was dealt with heavily by the Today's Papers. You see Prime Minister Jung Hong-won on the front pages here. And let's take a look at the Chungang Ilbo, which published a political cartoon that pokes fun at the entire ordeal. You can see Prime Minister Jung's legs on the right and President Park on the left holding a shovel. Now, it looks like she has just dug him out of a deep hole and she's seen cheering him on but in a meek voice and timid manner. The papers have questioned whether Chung will be able to overcome his mishandling of the Seoul ferry disaster and carry out reforms after already having offered his resignation. Now moving on to Tongang Ilbo uh, and the headline here reads from Facebook uh, to book Age of Snug. Now, the word snug is a word that combines SNS and book, and the article says that popular pieces of writing from social networks are being published into books and actually becoming bestsellers, giving birth to the word snug. Now, this week, the second best-selling item on a major online bookstore was actually a snug. Now, it, consists, it consisted of Facebook postings compiled by a young man in his mid-20s. Now, publishers say uh, by looking at the number of likes and a comment comments a post gets, they can actually predict how well the books will sell. The paper also adds that it's a win-win for up-and-coming writers as well who can better attract investors to help them publish a book. Now moving on to Joseon Ilbo, uh, which has a story on Korea's main financial district. The headline here reads, A Young Mind Marching Out of Yeoido. Now, Yeoido is an area in Seoul that is Korea's equivalent of Wall Street, and the article says the financial district is losing young business minds. Now, zooming in closer, taking a look at the graph here, the darker line in the graph shows the falling proportion of those in their 20s and 30s while the liner line uh, below shows the rising proportion of 30 and 40-somethings. This is because companies are cutting down on new employment or choosing not to hire anyone at all as they see their profitability falter due to the slowing economy. Now, naturally, already employed 20 to 30-year-olds feel more of a burden on their shoulders. Now, this here on the right is a resignation letter from a 30-year-old man who says he spent all day doing paperwork for all his co-workers who are over 40 years old and says he decided to leave because he simply sees no future in Korea's financial industry. Now that does it for this week's look at some of the eye-catching stories in the Korean press.
Thousands of angry protesters in Afghanistan are rallying through the capital city after reports emerged of widespread election fraud by state officials there. With uh, more on this story, Paul E is uh, joining us uh, from the News Center. Paul, Afghanistan is uh, still taking its first steps of democracy since the fall of the Taliban. What's marked this latest political crisis? Well, these protests have been intensifying since Afghan voters cast their ballots in the presidential runoff election earlier this month to replace incumbent President Hamid Karzai. Public outrage erupted when presidential candidate Abdullah Abdullah accused his opponents and Karzai of rigging the election. Abdullah supporters marched on the presidential palace in Kabul on Friday, demanding the government address the allegations of ballot stuffing. The former foreign minister has since dropped out of the race, paralyzing the democratic process. We have gathered here to demand our rights and condemn the fraudsters. We want our rights and will defend our rights to the last drop of our blood. Afghan security forces, meanwhile, have been battling rebel fighters in the southern province of Helmand as the government continues its war against the Taliban, which has ramped up attacks across the country. Authorities are saying that at least 100 Taliban fighters have been killed in fighting this past week along with scores of military and civilian casualties. Now, moving on to Europe, Paul, leaders of the 28-nation uh, bloc have gathered in Belgium to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the First World War. Can you tell us more about the ceremonies? Sure thing. European leaders, uh, leaders rather, began the Sol Memorial by holding a minute of silence for those who fell in World War I at the Menin Gate in the Belgian town of Ypres. The group then stamped a memorial bench with the word peace in the EU's 24 official languages. EU Council President Herman Van Rompuy was there to welcome leaders for the memorial service. We reaffirm that we are the guardians of vigilance. It is up to us, in word and deed, to break that spiral of escalation, to maintain confidence, to safeguard peace, a peace that we can dream of as permanent and everlasting peace. The memorial services come ahead of a key EU summit that will nominate the next president for the European Council. Former Prime Minister of Luxembourg Jean-Claude Juncker is widely expected to receive the nomination despite fierce opposition from Britain's David Cameron. Mm, I bet. And turning now to Africa, the young Sudanese woman, remember her, who was recently freed from the death penalty for marrying a Christian, has been detained by authorities once again. What's the latest with her? Well, 27-year-old Miriam Yaha Ibrahim was at the center of a new controversy on Thursday as she was detained at an airport in the Sudanese capital of Khartoum. Authorities say she was arrested for allegedly trying to use forged travel documents to leave the mostly Muslim northern Sudan. The mother of two who was freed from prison just a day before after a court overturned her conviction for renouncing Islam. This release does not mean she can leave Sudan because it is based on bail. Therefore, she is still subject to the charges against her and cannot travel unless these charges are dropped. Otherwise, these charges will have to be referred to a court. Ibrahim has since been released and her lawyer says she and her children have gone to the U.S. Embassy with her husband, who is an American citizen. And finally, Paul, my favorite man, the iconic comic book character Batman, is celebrating his 75th birthday, so he's pretty old there, uh, with the opening of a new attraction in the U.S. Uh, I'm a big fan of The Dark Knight. Uh, what can I expect from this exhibition? Well, the special exhibit opened its doors to the public on Thursday in Burbank, California, at the studios of Warner Brothers. The exhibit features a wide range of vehicles, costumes and other memorabilia from the franchise's history. Actor Danny DeVito, who played the villain The Penguin in 1992, was at the opening. I mean, you got to have a handsome guy play that part. I mean, you know, you, you, know, you can't get Paul Giamatti to play Batman. I mean, you know, all, in all due respect, Paul is a very nice guy and a good actor. Great actor. But you need somebody like, you know, like who fits in the suit. The Cape Crusader first appeared in Detective Comics number 27 in 1939. Batman went on to become one of the world's most popular action heroes, despite having no superhuman abilities, but instead relying on his wits, training, and high-tech gadgets in his quest for justice. Chetty? 
<laughs> All right, Paul, good stuff. Thanks for that uh, update. And we'll see you back here in just about two hours. And our Kim bo -kyung joins us uh, from the Weather Center for an update on weather front. Uh, it was a hot to summer day, and I used to appreciate this, but uh, maybe not anymore. Well, I'm sure you're not the only one because discomfort index is rising by the day as monsoon rains are set to fall a month later than in previous years for the inland regions. At the moment, we are at the edge of a high pressure system from the West Sea. On Saturday, showers are expected for some regions dropping between 5 to 40 millimeters. The rainfall should begin in Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province tomorrow morning and gradually spread to both Gyeongsangdo provinces. On to Saturday, Saturday's readings. Seoul hits 28, Daegu and Gwangju reach the low 30s. On to other regions, Daejeon mixed it to 29, Daeju and Mount Kumgang to the mid 20s. Well, as for World Cup weather, it's a mixed forecast over in Brazil with average daytime highs there reaching the mid 20s. Hope you have a lovely Friday evening, and I'll be back with more after 10. Happy Friday to you as well, and that does it for now. Thanks for watching.